Good morning, and thank you for joining us on the Power at Work blog today, where we'll be talking about the latest job numbers that have just come out from the Bureau of Labor Statistics at 830. So we have here with us um, two of my favorite labor economists uh, who will be joining us to discuss the numbers today. We have Harry Holzer, who is a professor of public policy at Georgetown's uh, Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy. Good morning, Harry. It's good to see you. Thank you, Alicia. Same here. Excellent. And joining us again, who's a favorite on the Power at Work blog, is Aaron Sojourner, who is joining us. Uh, he is a senior researcher at the Upjohn Institute for Employment Research. Good morning, Aaron. Hi, Alicia. Hi, Harry. Good morning. All right. Well, I'm going to give the headline numbers today since Seth Harris is on vacation, so he's letting me fill in uh, his very big shoes here. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics report, as I said, just came out uh, at 8.30 this morning, and we're giving you the basic headline numbers as well as our take on them. Uh, unemployment rate was at 3.5%. It was largely unchanged um, from the prior month, so uh, not a large increase in unemployment. The number of jobs created uh, in July was 187,000. That's a little bit below expectations. Economists were expecting around 200,000 or so. It's also below uh, the average that we've seen over the last year, which has been running around 300,000. Um, but uh, if we look back at where we were uh, for the numbers that were reported in June, if you take into account those revisions, um, the revisions, the revised down number was about 185,000. So we're kind of level for where we were at last month in terms of job creation. Wages, again, uh, are up. They're up 14 cents or 0.4% uh, uh, compared to last month. Um, and we look at an annualized rate that's about 4.4% over the last 12 months, or a little bit faster, about 5% over the last three months or so. So still seeing continued uh, pretty strong wage growth there. When we look just across some of the broader sectors in terms of where we're seeing this slowdown uh, in job growth and job creation, it's pretty broad slowdown across many sectors, although we still see um, strong wage growth or song, sorry, job growth in healthcare, social assistance, financial activities, and wholesale trade. Um, and for now, labor force participation, again, holding steady as it has been over the past uh, several months, uh, as well as prime age uh, labor force participation. So now I'm gonna go uh, to each of our panelists here in turn. Um, and dive in a little bit uh, into these numbers and get their first reactions. So um, first I'm gonna go to Harry. Harry, are these numbers good for workers, bad for workers, or are they a mixed bag? Give us your brief reaction to these headline numbers. Um, my view is that it's good uh, because uh, I'm looking for a Goldilocks labor market, uh, not too hot, because if it's too hot, the Fed will jack up interest rates more and cause a downturn. Not too cool, because that means maybe that downturn has started. What I want to see is steady progress, steady and sustainable progress for American workers. And I think these numbers say that. The, the 187 payroll growth number that Alicia mentioned, coupled with the revision of last month to 185, uh, now you have two months in a row of below 200,000, which is which is considerably less than we've seen in earlier months, but you're starting to get in a range of labor force and, and payroll growth that's sustainable. Uh, and that does it still strong, by the way, by any historical measure, still strong, but, but more sustainable. Um, and then the wage growth number, uh, Felicia, uh, Alicia, as you said, it's in the four to 5% range over the last three months, over the last year. That's probably still a little high, for the Fed's comfort. Now, and as labor economists, we like to see it. We like to see, and, and inflation recently has come in at 3%. So that implies some nice real wage growth for workers. And that might make the Fed a little antsy, uh, but I'll quote one other number from yesterday. Uh, we had a very good productivity mm. growth number yesterday, much higher, I think the highest number in at least three years. And when you have productivity growth, productivity growth does not always show up in workers' paychecks. But when you have high productivity growth and an ongoing strong labor market, I think there's more pressure on employers to share uh, to share in, in the productivity growth with workers. Uh, and that's a really good thing, because then you really can have 
wage growth ahead of inflation without setting off alarm bells. So I think overall, I view it as a quite positive report. Great. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, uh, on the face of it, when you see uh, a job growth number that's below expectations or below, you know, the really hot labor market that we've seen over the last several months, your first instinct is to say, whoa, what's going on? You know, is this really still a good story for workers? But as you said, you know, we're kind of getting back to what's a stable, maintainable job growth, right? That that isn't going to be uh, accelerating inflation or, you know, potentially overheating the economy, which is really good. I mean, it is the smallest gain that we've seen since about December 2020. But again, you know, we're back to sort of the pre-pandemic uh, operating maybe of the labor market and coupled with that great news on productivity. Uh, yeah, I think that that's a, a much better picture than uh, folks would take away from their initial glance at what this number is. Aaron, what do you what did you think about today's report? Do you think it's good for workers, bad for workers, mixed bag? What's your sense here? Yeah, it's I agree with Harry's points, and I think it's definitely good for workers. Uh, shows sign of continued employer demand in the labor market, uh, moderation towards what the Fed will think are more sustainable um, pace of growth. You know, I think something really good that Harry touched on, just to put a number on it, you know. Over the last three months, wage growth has been about 4.9% at an annualized rate compared to you know, about 2.7% for price growth. So that's 2.2% you know, uh, real wage growth for every hour you're working. Um, you know, you're, can buy 2.2% 2, 2 more uh, goods and services uh, than you could three months ago on average for American workers. That, and that's good news because, you know, with the spike in inflation in the past, uh, recent past, people did lose ground and um, it's good to see that ground being made up. Well, I think, you know, I'm gonna make it unanimous, which is just, I think, kind of crazy when you get three economists uh, talking mm. about the same topic and we're all agreeing about it. But uh, I, I do also think that this is a good jobs report uh, for workers. Um, you know, it's not, uh, uh, like I said, you know, a, a big jump or, uh, you know, an overheating kind of number, but it's consistent, it's steady, it's kind of ret a return to what we would have considered just a healthy labor market. Um, I think along with not just the productivity number, but the good numbers we've seen on GDP, uh, the good numbers we've seen on consumer spending, uh, over this, you know, last month, I don't know if that's, you know, the Barbie movie or uh, revenge travel. There's a lot going on this summer with consumer spending, but people seem to be able to sustain, you know, this level of economic activity that keeps the economy chugging along, keeps the labor market uh, in a healthy spot. And I think overall, that's that's good for workers. And then I think coupled with the wage growth that we've seen, again, you know, to Harry's point, that you know that prosperity is being shared with the workers, right? It's not just being kept uh, with the firms. All right, so I'm gonna jump back to you, Harry, and I'm gonna uh, ask you our second question here. What are the numbers below the headlines that you think are important this month? So what's, what's something that caught your eye in this report that maybe not everybody's talking about, but that you see as you know something we should really lift up? Uh, a couple of things. Um, the labor force participation rate uh, stayed at 62.6%. Now, we had a bunch of months earlier this year uh, where the, the labor force was steadily increasing. Uh, prime age women were coming back to the labor force, immigrants were pouring in, and that helped us to sustain the really high payroll growth. But now, for several months, uh, it has flattened out, which now means it's more imperative maybe to get the payroll growth down to not have more imbalance in the labor market between supply and demand. So uh, it, it seems like the progress we've made on labor force participation is not eroding, but, but it's flattened out and that has implications for uh, the rest of the economy. The other thing I noticed a few other small indicators of slowing uh, in the labor market, uh, weekly hours dropped mm. only by a 10th of a percent from 34.5 to 34.4. And that's usually a sign that that employers aren't pushing their workers for long hours, that things are calming down a little bit. And the other thing is that uh, temp employment, which is 
often pretty sensitive to the business cycle uh, uh, and, and to business conditions, temp employment dropped, not a huge drop, 22,000, uh, but similar to last month's drop. So again, when you see the temp numbers coming down, it might be, along with the hours decline, it, it's suggesting just a, a little bit of that heat in the labor market uh, being pulled out and, and things calming down in, in what I think is, is largely a healthy way. Yeah, so maybe, you know, when you think about uh, musical chairs, right, the music is kind of slowing down, everyone needs to find a spot to sit down and uh, have to be their permanent spot. I noticed, um, you know, I think workers who are on temporary layoff have, have has come down as well. So, you know, it seems like, um, you know, folks are getting plugged into the labor market, maybe where they need to be. Um, and that uh, we're getting to some stable level of work, right, where uh, it's not, you know, just a, a bunch of workers who are working lots of hours and, and others who are shut out of the labor market. But as we bring more folks into different positions, employers can fill these roles. You know, we can get to something that's more sustainable for everybody. Aaron, what are you seeing in terms of, you know, what's your, your kind of nugget that you're going to take away from today? Well, one thing I've been tracking is the employment to population ratio, the share of, um, of Americans employed who are African American and who are white. So if you go, we have data for the last 50 years. And historically, there's been, I don't know, somewhere between like a 10 and 20% gap with whites having higher employment rates than blacks, due to a combination of, you know, a lot of complex factors that you can imagine. Uh, in March, for the first time, in the data, African Americans actually had higher employment rates than whites, uh, and it was just one month. But, but you know, you could see that that usual gap closing during this very tight labor market, and um, then it started falling again. And I've been paying attention to that, trying to see if that's gonna we're gonna like revert back to the historical pattern with uh, African-American employment shares falling. Um, but this month, actually, it stopped falling and, you know, went up a little. And so, I don't know, I'm got my eye on that, hopefully uh, stabilizing with a very small uh, gap between the two populations and ho hope for more uh, equitable outcomes uh, for all Americans, you know, in, in the labor market ahead. Um, so. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, that is the tricky part when we do start seeing the labor market um, slowing down or not as overheated as before. You know, when, when you have a super strong labor market, that is where you get to pull people in from the sidelines who maybe maybe you either have been marginalized or who have been waiting, you know, until they're able to come into the labor market. So you think of everything from, you know, historic populations that have been left out of previous recoveries, whether that's uh, black workers or, you know, returning citizens or um, immigrants or women or whatever those groups are. And so we did see those gains for a while and, and that, you know, sort of historic moment where, you know, we saw some real progress made. But um, this is the point where, where that part starts to wind down. But it'd be nice if it were, you know, stabilizing. I know for myself, you know, one of the things that I'm taking away uh, from today's jobs report is, you know, as usual, I have my eye on the teenage labor market, uh, you know, based on a lot of the research that I've done. And it's also, you know, it's summertime, it's summer jobs. I know that uh, City of Boston is working really hard to make sure that every young person who wants a job can have one. Um, and we have the last two years seen an incredibly strong labor market for teenagers where, um, you know, uh, they're being offered jobs uh, uh, not just in greater numbers, but also with, you know, higher pay. So you're looking at, uh, you know, big box stores like Target and Walmart offering $17, you know, an extra $2 an hour if you work the weekends or the nights. And that's super attractive uh, to a lot of teenagers. And we've yeah. seen their, um, you know, employment to population ratio increasing, more of them coming into the labor market to look for jobs. Um, and so it's it's been a real, you know, win for teenagers coming back out of the pandemic where they had a 30% unemployment rate, you know, in July of 2020. And uh, now we're uh, much below that. One thing I do want to um, point out, though, as, as you know, you were saying, Aaron, I always keep an eye 
on the gap between different groups of teenagers, uh, particularly for the July number, which is sort of the height of the teenage labor market. And it's you know almost always the case that the unemployment rate for white teenagers is lower than black and Hispanic teenagers. But we've really been seeing a widening gap um, over this summer, which is kind of surprising to me. So for example, um, out of today's report for July, the unemployment rate for white teenagers was 9.5%. Uh, for Black teenagers, it was 20.7%, right? So almost twice as high, uh, which is kind of the largest that uh, we ever see that gap um, in terms of summertime employment. And at the same time, it's also just moving in the wrong direction, right? So I know we get blips up, we get blips down, but that Black uh, teenage unemployment rate has moved from you know 11.7% in May to 15.6% in June to 20.7% in July. Some of that's to be expected as more teenagers come into the labor market to look for work, but by July, you expect that to go down. And, and that's what we have seen in the white uh, numbers is that they initially blipped up a bit as more kids you know, started looking for jobs, they land jobs, and then that number comes down. So I'm a little bit concerned with that. I'm not exactly sure where that's gonna land. We do have one more uh, jobs report in the summer to be able to see um, you know, how teenagers land in the labor market. I do know some kids are still finding jobs. So I'll be interested to see where that lands, um, you know, as, as we get to the end of the summer. But I agree, you know, it's, it's definitely something to watch and something that, you know, we hope some of the gains that we had in the previous months don't become undone. I, I will say even for um, the full population, the Black unemployment rate is still twice as high as the white unemployment rate. So um, yeah, those two things can go together. And, right. and, and, and labor force participation uh, among Black men uh, remains pretty low. So I think the numbers are a real mix. We, we still have major disparities uh, to worry about. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it, I think for a long time, we've been saying that uh, nobody wants to waste a strong labor market in workforce development. I know all of the policymakers that I work with have been pushing very hard to make sure that uh, they can get their most vulnerable populations employed, um, that they can you know, make those job placements coming out of training programs um, and be able to uh, slot workers into jobs. And so you know, a lot of those gains that have been made would be great if there's a way for us to sustain that. I know, I think last week we were, or last month we were talking about how, um, you know, how this plays out in terms of worker power and thinking about uh, do we want worker power really to be subject to the whims of the labor market? Like, oh, when it's strong, you know, we have a, a, a leg up, but then how do we, how do we sustain those gains going, uh, going forward? That kind of gets me, I guess, to our last question. I, I sort of already tipped my hat uh, in that direction, but really, you know, the focus here is, is thinking about how this jobs report speaks to what's going on with worker power. I know, you know, we've had a lot more activity in terms of um, uh, strikes and also in terms of uh, union activity. And so it's a really interesting time right now to be thinking about these dynamics as we're coming out of the pandemic, as we've had this crazy hot labor market. So again, Harry, I'm gonna go to you first and, um, you know, just give us our take on, you know, what you've seen over the last, you know, not just the last month, but the last six months to a year, like, where do you think we are in terms of worker power? Do you think we're still on the rise here? How do you think this is going to play out as maybe we head to this soft landing? Well, I think what we'd all like to see uh, is continuing evidence of worker power, but again, at a level that's sustainable. And so a few, a few measures, you know, the quit rate uh, is in many ways a pretty good indication mm. of how much power workers think they have. Uh, that's been coming down from what we used to call the great resignation and quits are almost back to sort of the pre-pandemic level. Maybe that's because workers have gotten rid of all their surplus savings that they piled up in the pandemic. Maybe they're worried about a downturn. So the decline in the quit rates suggests more caution by workers. On the other hand, the labor market by any measure remains very tight uh, at 3.5% unemployment, vacancy rates much higher than that. And a tight labor market is, is a very good thing to enhance worker power. Um, and, and again, if we get the soft landing, but at the same time maintain that level of tightness, a soft landing with still an ongoing very tight labor market, 
uh, it, it is quite good news for workers, I think. And if we can keep that labor market tight, then workers have the power to grab a slightly bigger, or maybe not slightly, a bigger slice of that productivity growth uh, that we saw in the last quarter. So I think this is quite encouraging, a sustainable level of tightness, worker power, and worker ability to grab a chunk of the nation's output, when in recent years, they've grabbed too little of that output. Yeah, I think you raise a great point in terms of the soft landing, really being able to hopefully sustain some of these gains that workers have made, because a lot of times, right, we seesaw back into recession, right, employers take back what some of those gains are, um, workers are scrambling to be able to even just keep a job. Um, it's been really interesting to watch over the last like month or so, uh, a lot of uh, economists kind of taking back the R word, you know, walking that back, talking more about soft landing. Um, I don't think I've uh, heard as many comments about soft landing in the positive way as I have in the last month, um, but it seems like we've kind of convinced the dismal uh, uh, field here that we're in that, okay, maybe, maybe it's going to be all right. Um, and, you know, certainly when you get these jobs reports that are cooler and more stable over time, it definitely lends itself to that. Aaron, you know, what are you seeing in terms of worker power? What's your kind of take on the summary of what we've seen today, as well as putting it into the context of the last, you know, six months to a year or so? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the big story is that, you know, corporate prop, co companies raise their prices a lot and their profits a lot when there was supply constraints during the pandemic. And, you know, they were, the profit margins are like, corporate profits per dollar sold, um, you know, went up quite a lot. And now what we're seeing is that unwinding, that unfattening of profit margins. Um, but if you compare a recent quarter to last quarter pre-pandemic, you know, these profit, corporate profits per dollar value added by the firm still up about 25%. And, you know, wages are only up about 14% labor costs hourly are only up about that. So there's still room for labor market pressure by workers um, through quits, through organizing, through union contracts, um, through just individual negotiations um, to claim, yeah, more of the share of the value that um, is created by the employer and the worker together in the job. And um, also, I think more scope to see as um, these supply constraints loosen, you know, new entrants come in, uh, more competition, harder, sharper competition in product markets uh, that dampen price growth, maybe even disinflate prices, bring prices down a bit uh, in certain markets. And so both of those like higher labor compensation, lower prices, more competition in the labor market, more competition in product markets, those are gonna unfatten profits. And there's still some scope for that to happen, for workers to be doing better, for consumers to be doing better at the expense of the company owners and they don't like it, but it, um, you know, that keeps these gains for workers and consumers sustainable. Um, to some extent for a while still. Um, so I think that's exciting. That's what we're seeing. And, and I think that's appropriate. You know, there was this big ramp up in profits during the, um, when these supply constraints were very tight. So kind of seeing that unwind. Yeah, I think, you know, one thing that's good also is that the demographics are on our side to some extent, right? And so um, baby boomers still are not getting any younger and yeah. they are, they accelerated their retirement a little bit during the pandemic, but even those who've been holding on, you know, uh, to that job as long as they possibly can, you know, are, are moving into those golden years where they will be leaving the labor market. And it's just, you know, a numbers game that the, the generations, the cohorts coming behind them are smaller, right? And so, you know, that may also help us keep some sustained pressure in the labor market where it's just not going to be super easy to go out and replace workers. And I think firms to some extent do know this, right? That even in any of uh, 
the slowdown that we've seen, they're holding on to workers, right? They're not shedding workers very quickly. They worked really hard to find these people exactly. to potentially train them, to put them into these positions. They know turnover is really expensive. They also know it could take a very long time to get those workers back based on recent experience. And so I think that is helping us extend, you know, this tale of, um, you know, feeling that labor market pressure and having it mean something for workers. The, the thing that's also, you know, really, I think, incredibly helpful is when you do have inflation running below wage growth, then that does mean, right, that uh, workers have more money in their pockets that helps them sustain consumer spending. But then that also means that they feel more secure um, in their position in the labor market because they are getting you know, that real wage bump where they can potentially save, where they can potentially invest in education, uh, in training, in, in a variety of ways of, you know, being able to even move up in the labor market. I think that would be the thing for me that would really solidify these gains is if we could help people move up in the labor market. We've been really good at drawing them back in, getting them into entry-level positions that are paying a decent wage now, but what does that career trajectory, you know, look for folks and how does that you know, maintain a sustainable wage as we go forward. I think one of the last things that, you know, we'll, we'll probably be watching very closely over the next month is what the Fed does with all of this information um, that they're getting. We know that, uh, you know, inflation has been coming down. We're in a better place than we were a year ago. We know that inflation in the U.S. is lower than in Europe. So the Fed's done a really good job. We're all talking soft landing. Um, but now it's it's decision time. And you heard Jay Powell say it's going to be very data driven. So, you know, they're watching very closely what's happening with this jobs report, uh, thinking about what that maybe last rate hike is going to look like, um, where, you know, I can't imagine it would be a very large one. But that, that is what they have been signaling is at least one last rate hike. Um, and hopefully that uh, that will not, you know, further cool the labor market below something that that's healthy, right? That's what we want to stay in this nice Goldilocks environment that that Harry was talking about. All right. Any any final thoughts here from either of you before we wrap up? I'll, I'll just say one more thing. And Alicia, since you talked about sort of career ladders and upward mobility for workers, the other piece of that puzzle besides worker power, you know, workers need to have the skills that employers are really mm -hmm. looking for. Um, I've been a little concerned at the decline in college enrollments, especially community college enrollments. Um, maybe that's temporary. Maybe that's cyclical because enrollments do drop in really tight labor markets. But I, I'm hoping we see a reverse in that uh, and, and maybe make some progress on strong uh, uh, strong workforce development programs. Uh, Biden administration is doing some helpful things on, on student debt. Uh, um, I would like to see those numbers go back up because workers do need a combination of strong skills uh, as well as power. Yeah, and we saw some real, you know, great research evidence, a lot of good progress made with, you know, sector-based programs that have, you know, these really strong designs that are tied to uh, an employer, an industry, a job, you know, at the, at the end of that training program. And so I feel like we've got some great evidence on what works and it'd be great to invest in those, you know, as you said, to keep, keep this moving, keep that, um, that progress, that skills progress going. Any last thoughts, Aaron, on your part? Well, I'll just echo something you said, which is that I think we are, employers are traumatized a bit by their experiences and, coming in trying to rebuild their their staff after laying a lot of people off and you know they are recognize the costs of creating jobs like the search costs the matching costs and like they see jobs now i think more than they did in the past in recent decades as as assets and like recognize the value of those matches that they form and are more reluctant to just destroy those. And I think that's good news for, uh, because those costs are real and, and they get overlooked a lot um, by managers. Um, so, you know, in one sign of that is that layoffs and discharges also are, have been quite low. And um, so I think that's uh, good, good news. Um, and that should also spur investment in on the job training and uh, you know career development um, within the firm and within the employer. Um, so hopefully 
we'll, we'll see more of that ahead. Yeah, I think the cost benefit on turnover versus training is something that employers just lived in real time. And maybe that equation has changed a little bit, which would be really nice for workers, right? Yeah. Um, excellent. Well, thank you so much to my wonderful uh, friends and fellow panelists here, Harry Holzer. Uh, from Georgetown, from the uh, McCourt School of Public Policy, and Aaron Sojourner from um, the Upjohn Institute for Employment Research. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was really excellent to have you here. And um, everybody else, please do um, go to the Power at Work blog, where you can not only see a recording of this live stream as we uh, discuss today's jobs report, but there will also be um, a brief write-up as well, so you can take away some of the key points that we made um, in any form that you want, whether it's watching uh, this uh, blog post or whether it's um, in readable form. And we look forward to seeing you again uh, on our next jobs day about a month from now. So thanks so much for joining us.